<laughs> no. uh, thank you all for your speeches. They were all great. Really, really appreciated all of them. Um, I would like a sanity check for me. Okay, so I have been against Russian sanctions from the beginning. I have been very vocal about it, written about it. I think Europe, Europe's policy has been insane. I think it's been driven by Washington, um, which I think is clearly evident. Um, and I think a lot of what's happened in Eastern Europe has been because of American policy. But European politicians are acting in a way, to me, that are completely contrary to the interests of Europeans. And I just want to know, what am I missing? Am I, am I missing a huge piece here that I just am not getting? You know. uh, these questions would be appropriate tomorrow when I give my speech, but none, none of these. <laughs> yeah, but none of none of these gentlemen said a word about this problem. So I think this question is not appropriate to this audience. Okay, now, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that I don't allow them to have an opinion or. Um, <laughs> But, but they should just express their opinion uh, in private and wait until I'm done tomorrow or then. <laughs> and, and, then and then anybody can say whatever they want and condemn me or not condemn me or whatever it is. <laughs> so, all right. So, next question, please. Or if you have, or if, or, or, or if, or, or if you have another question, you can ask, ask that as well, okay? <laughs> but in fairness to the gentleman, I have to... Huh? No comment. Yeah, all right. I think... No, I think so too. Yeah, all right. Next question. So uh, I will try to keep my question uh, on the uh, topic. Um, I have a question for uh, Professor Karl Friedrich Israel with a hat tip to uh, Torsten Polite also. Um, the um, in inflation is one thing, but unemployment is also a statistic which could easily be fudged. Uh, it happened in 26th of April 2007 that the um, empirical economists hired by the state of France went on strike because they were uh, forced to publish unemployment numbers that were uh, so fudged that even by their own exalted standards, uh, they, they refused to do so. Um, so uh, when I go to uh, a private statistician uh, named John Williams, who has this website, Shadow Government Statistics, he thinks for the US currently, the unemployment is at 24% um, instead of the official 4%. And he also thinks that the CPI is at 12% uh, compared to the official 8%. Although he also has a 1980 uh, technology uh, which puts it at 16%. So I don't know, either. I think the 12% is the Boskin Commission that you described. I'm not exactly sure how he gets to the 1980 numbers because he doesn't publish his methodology. So uh, obviously this is all a uh, violation of the Phillips curve, which says that uh, you can have high unemployment, low inflation, or, or the opposite, you know. Uh, but here we have, uh, according to John Williams, very high unemployment, very high inflation. So who should I believe John Williams, the private statistician, or the Phillips curve? The easy answer is they are all wrong. Yeah, so it always depends. Uh, I cannot really give an informed uh, opinion or response to the question of unemployment, but um, as far as the inflation rates are concerned that uh, John William publishes on his website, I have looked into those as well. Um, I think it's a problem that uh, it is not uh, quite transparent the way he calculates it. I'm also wondering where he got the data because a lot of the data that is necessary actually to recalculate these statistics is not openly available. Um, it might be different in the US. Uh, in Europe, in Germany in particular, you don't get the data. What you would need is um, 
data uh, of the individual items that are in the baskets, not only the prices, but also the weights. And both of these are not available. And you can ask for uh, a special permission to look at the data, and the conditions are really uh, not very inviting. Uh, you have to pay a lot of money, first of all, and then you get permission to come to uh, some office somewhere and look at a computer without internet connection for a specified amount of time. I'm not even sure you can take the data away on a USB uh, drive or something like that. Yeah? So it, almost seems as if the official offices are not interested in being transparent about this. So whom should you believe? Uh, none of them. Uh, the truth may, may lie somewhere in between. Um, I have a question for Professor Hulsman. Um, with regards to the dualism of scientific knowledge, uh, the, the natural uh, sciences on the one hand and then um, e economic science, praxeology on the other hand. I was wondering, um, are economists who carry out empirical research, are they contributing to economic science or true economic science? Or are they uh, contributing to the third option, namely meaningful uh, facts, um, li like s statistical, statistical facts. Like, are they contributing to to economic theory or to history? I mean, uh, uh, the, these works, by and large, are uh, worthless as far as economic theory is uh, is concerned, because you you cannot derive any regularities from these observations, right? And even if you find regularities, that's something that you have to explain in itself which you could do only in the light of economic reasoning, right? For example, if you find a regularity between the variations of the money supply and the variations of the price index during a certain time frame, you say, yes, I mean, this has something to do with the quantity theory of money, right? And, but as we have heard this, this afternoon, there are, or this morning, there are other factors that also come into play, right? So it's a compound effect of different universal mechanisms. Um, but, but statistical work and econometric work uh, can be helpful as a description of the factual situation that you had at a certain period or a certain moment in time. So uh, therefore, I think the, 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 the Austrian uh, take on econometrics would be to take it as a point of departure, not as an answer, right? It raises questions, but it doesn't give you answers. The answers need to come from theoretical reasoning and from understanding. Um, I have another question. Sure. Um, would you um, or would Mises uh, categorize uh, psychology or, as he called it, timology or timology mm. or m mathematics? Would he ca categorize these uh, disciplines into uh, natural science or like the rational philosophy? As as praxeology is uh, is is, a, is an example of well, well thymology would be part of history, right? So the, the purpose is precisely uh, to to gain an under, understanding of the meaning that the acting person attaches to his situation and to understand why he acts in the way he acts. Uh, mathematics is is more complicated. Uh, I'm I'm not enough of a mathematician. Uh, but I've, I've, I've seen very interesting articles on, on the topic, right? So, so some people claim it's just an emanation of, of logic. Uh, some say, well, uh, mathematics num numbers have, have a logic of, of their own. Um, so it's, it's uh, some mathematical realism and, and so on, right? So there are uh, uh, different things. I, I w wouldn't be able to classify. Mises says, I think he, his, his take would be that mathematics is an outgrow of, of logic. In any case, it's, it's, it's different from uh, natural uh, science on the one hand and economics right? So on the other hand. But the interesting thing would be indeed, right, if you think uh, through his argument in the ultimate foundation of economic science, that epistemology and logic, therefore, have a praxeological basis. Right? Where is the praxeological basis in, in mathematics? But I, I don't have the answer. And I have a third question for you, if this is allowed. If it's short, yeah. um, which we, 
with regards to Mises' um, um, critique of quantum physics, um, can you or could Mises uh, um, uh, imagine or can an instrument exist in our position, in a human position, that can uh, disprove the universal and time invariable constancy, constancy principle? Like that, that all laws are always and forever true. Can, uh, can we ever get to an instrument or make an instrument that could disprove this? Yeah, the, the, it's a good question. I, his take would be, well, um, when, when we do research of any sort in the natural science, right, we need to approach our observation with the hypothesis that there's an invariable concatenation of cause and effect. There's no exception. Right? So otherwise, uh, you, um, so, so then the question is, where do we get this regularity postulate from? Right? And he says it's, it's, uh, it's implied in the category of action. And I, I don't agree with him on this. Right? So I think you, ha you have to assume this, but it's not something that comes from action. Right? So my, my disagreement with him would be there. And uh, it, in my eyes, this is where um, uh, also belief comes into play. And I think uh, I'm siding there more with Augustine than with Mises. Augustine once famously said, I believe so that I understand. I understand, therefore I believe more strongly. And here we have to believe that there is a constant relationship. Inanimate objects don't choose. <laughs> And they always produce the same consequence, follows from the, but we don't know this, right? It's not something that we can know, and it doesn't follow from the, the category of action. Mm -hmm. I have a question uh, for Carl Friedrich Israel about the inflation. I must say I love inflation myself. It's uh, dangerous to say this in an archo capitalist uh, environment, but. Uh, I made some money by uh, buying assets with borrowed money, and inflation did the rest. <laughs> <coughs> but my question is, um, could there be, I don't know if that's true, but how, how do you see uh, they keep the, in, the inflation lower than it really is? Could it be the reason that they want to keep the interest low to the states can borrow money for free money almost, and then the inflation does the rest? Uh, so it pays off all the debts by itself. Yeah, there obviously is a conflict of interest there on the part of the government, uh, because the government is one of the big beneficiaries of uh, low interest rate policies. Um, and you cannot really uh, increase the interest rates right now uh, without um, causing uh, a liquidation crisis and um, uh, lots of problems also for governments uh, in terms of uh, public finances. So that is one reason why the ECB uh, officially uh, changed uh, the, the strategy uh, from uh, going back to 2% as fast as possible, uh, as soon as possible, to a gradual approach, uh, right? So that's what I mentioned in the, in the talk. Um, they gradually want to reduce the inflation rates and they want to slowly increase the interest rates in order to get there over time, uh, so not to provoke this, uh, this crisis. Um, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's, that's all, all I can say about that. Uh, it really depends on the willingness um, uh, to, to bring about such a liquidation crisis um, to, yeah, to really get rid of the problem. It would be very harmful in the short run. Um, I believe that uh, it would be uh, good in the long run um, if people understand the necessity of the liquidation crisis, right? If people don't understand that, then of course, such a short-term liquidation crisis can cause a lot of problems politically and, and economically as well in the long run. Um, but if people understand why it is actually important and, and, and 
useful, beneficial in the long run to go through this, uh, yeah, then that would be great. But I am, I'm afraid people don't understand that. Um, again, the question for you, um, Carl. Um, so, um, talking about inflation, and the financial market uh, would say, oh, we cannot raise interest rate too rapidly because that would, that would induce um, a systemic risk, blah, blah, blah. But um, when I look at, you know, I come to Turkey since um, 2012, and, you know, Turkey is famous, you know, because they have high inflation. And my friends here seem to, uh, I mean, they survive. Uh, I know there is pain, but I mean, you know, you don't see riots on the, well, at least I don't see riots on the street. So what would happen if the ECB think, oh, then we just go the Turkey way, just let it inflate. I will keep printing, just let it go. Is that there is a possibility, and what would be the consequence if they go the Turkey, the Turkish way? Well, yeah, excellent uh, question. I think that's exactly the route they will go. Uh, get used to higher inflation. It's not that bad. Uh, look at Turkey. They make it uh, work somehow, so we can do that also. Um, I think, yeah, this is very likely uh, as a scenario for the future. Um, because it is, in the short run, less harmful to uh, those people who make the decisions. Uh, and that's why uh, I think it's, it's going, it's, it's very likely, it's a very likely scenario, yes. And, and maybe uh, yet other panel speaker could also comment if, if you like. Oh, uh, other panelists, you may want to comment. Uh, I do agree that maybe a, a solution of free reign of inf inflation is, is uh, possible. I don't know if likely. What I see is uh, they will try, as usual in these situations, to make other kinds of interventions, especially on prices. Uh, in some European countries, for example, in, in Italy, my country, they are already talking about um, maximum prices, and so this will be part of a manufactured scarcity crisis because if you set maximum prices, this of course causes scarcity, especially in, in the food market, which is what uh, is the, the discussion right now. So probably we will see food scarcity artificially created by the stupid intervention of governments which try to solve the problems. It's a very ancient story. I talked about Roman history. The um, Emperor Diocletian tried to solve the hor horrendous inflation of the third century after Christ by setting maximum prices. The, the penalty was death penalty if you tried to sol sell something beyond the maximum price. And he failed miserably as always uh, price controls fail. I would argue that inflation is, uh, is an evil. And if you say people are fine with inflation, I recommend go to a little shop and ask the average guy over here, and he will give you a very different answer, what he thinks about inflation. Inflation is a problem. It's not only that the currency will be debased, so that you get fewer and fewer goods in exchange of your currency. It leads to a redistribution of income and wealth among a country, a society, an econo in, in economy, and it, it, it's, a, it's a fraud. Inflation only works if it takes people by surprise. If people are surprised by actual inflation coming in higher than expected. In this case, there is this redistribution of income and wealth going on. And that is the reason why governments who would, would like to get rid of their outstanding debt must rely on surprise inflation. But people learn sooner or later that they have been tricked, that they increase their inflation expectation. In the next round, the surprise inflation has to become even higher. 
And so this is the path towards hyperinflation. I would argue that Turkey is already in hyperinflation. Uh, there's a definition in textbooks saying hyperinflation is if goods prices rise by 50% per month. On an annualized basis, that implies an inflation of 12,900%. 12,900%. That, that means if your cup of coffee costs $3 today, in 12 months it will cost $390. That is what 12,900% inflation means. So hyperinflation, I think we are well advised to think of high inflation at a much lower level, maybe by 5% uh, goods price increase per month. And I would argue we are on the way towards hyperinflation. And, uh, because if inflation has gone up, it becomes very, very costly to bring it down again. You need a stability recession, as they call it. You have to crush the economic system in order to break the upward price expectations of firms and private households. It's very, very costly. And I think we have reached, on a global level, a situation where most economies are in a situation of over-indebtedness. And that is why central banks raise interest rates only gradually. And I, I, I fear that you won't see a stabilization recession, that sooner or later they will stop with uh, hiking interest rates. And high inflation uh, will remain, is, is going to here to stay. And the downward risk is really that we move towards a hyperinflation scenario. There is, of course, a redistribution effect, so there are some people who benefit from this sort of thing. Otherwise, we would not be able to explain why the whole thing happens in the first place. I mean, why is the money supply increased at all? And the answer is, yeah, for some people that's good. For, us, for most of the people, it's a disaster. I wanted to make that uh, same comment. So the, the argument that Torsten made is the uh, textbook argument for inflationary stimulus. So you have to have a surprise inflation so that the real economy is stimulated and you have higher economic growth than you would otherwise have. Um, but as far as the redistribution effect is concerned, that works whether or not people expect the inflation rate or not. It uh, doesn't depend on whether the inflation comes as a surprise or the expansion of the money uh, stock comes as a surprise. Uh, by the very expansion of the money stock, you set in motion this redistribution effect. Hi, I, I got a question for uh, Sandro. Um, you talked about how Caesar had to kill two to three million people in his campaign through Gaul. I'm, I'm guessing he was killing them because they were resisting. So uh, I, was, I was raised in the colony of the British Empire. And there are times in which I heard from my teachers, they were British, that uh, sometimes, you know, being ruled by an uh, empire is good, because that's what happened to England. Uh, we learned a lot from the Romans, and that was partly justifying why the British went out there and got themselves an empire. So, I mean, as a, as a person who lived in the colony, I appreciate things like the common law system, for example. How many generations did it how long did it take for a typical person in one of these provinces, conquered provinces, to realize that the Roman system was superior to what they had previously? I mean, the British obviously acknowledged that, but I don't know when they acknowledged that. Uh, was it a matter of months? Did they, a couple of disputes with the Roman judge ruling very wisely with, you know, test cases previously, and they think, wow, this is a great system. Well, did it take generations? That's the first question. And the second question uh, concerns um, the redistribution of spoils, especially land, to soldiers. How did that actually work? Because if I was a soldier, and someone was given farmland that is productive from day one, and I was given like a forest in which I need to chop down, then how do I reconcile that with, with my fellow you know, colleague in, in the army. And how big was that piece of land? I mean, how, I, was it like, as far as the eye can see, or was it like 40 acres and a mule? That kind of thing. I mean, logistically, how did they, you know, divvy up the spoils? Well, first question, <clears throat> I don't know if it really worked that way. 
um, uh, Romans um, de facto, or de facto, by, by means of, of military might, colonized most of the known world at that time. Uh, it is interesting to note that this uh, worked in a certain way in the west of Europe and in another way in the east of Europe, where um, in the east especially the uh, superior uh, strength of Greek culture at, at the end uh, created a new civilization, the Hellenistic civilization and the Byzantine civilization, which, wa which was uh, a derivation of, of the Roman order, but for example, already at the time of, of Justinian, the, the emperor who is the, the, uh, the author of the, of the uh, Corpus Juris and the Digest, the, the compilation of, of Roman law, uh, the, the main language was Greek in the Eastern Empire. So it was completely different. Whereas in Spain, in modern Spain, in France, uh, the penetration of the Romans was very strong, uh, not different than the one the British had, for example. I'm not sure that there was a realization that the, the uh, imperial system was better. In fact, there have been lots of rebellions, lots of revolutions, uh, attempts to get rid of the of the Roman system, which meant basically taxes, because this is the 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 main issue about all empires. They could extract lots of of money from the from the provinces. So uh, the 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 military might established the uh, Roman way. Uh, the Roman language bega became necessary because you had to deal with your overlords and so you had to adopt their language. It couldn't be different and gradually, gradually the, the ancient Latin morphed into the, the modern uh, Romans uh, uh, languages, but I don't think that there was sort of a realization or acceptance. Yes, there was an acceptance, but it was based mainly on, on military might and on the, on the superior strength, this is clear of the, of the Roman armies, which for a long time were invincible. It's interesting to note that when bureaucracy took over the armies during the second, third century after Christ, this uh, destroyed the, the Roman Empire together with inflation, with uh, big taxes and so on. Um, Second part of the of the question. Uh, what, what was it? Sorry, what did you ask? Uh, how 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 did the uh, land redistribution? Ah, uh, yeah, the, the land distribution. Well, it was uh, a very bureaucratic and regulated system. Uh, for example, at the end of the Republic, there was um, one very important distribution of lands to the veterans of Pompeii, and uh, they established a commission of of twenty. Uh, magistrates who had to allot uh, lands in, in uh, southern Italy near uh, Capua where they had these very good lands, very fertile lands. It was all strictly and very uh, uh, regulated in, in the tiniest details. The Romans, they have many bad characteristics but they were wonderful organizers. They were uh, a people of engineers, of builders, and of, of, uh, of lawyers in part. So nothing was left to, to chance. It was very, very uh, strictly organized. And this superior organization of the army as well as of the, of the government is one of the reasons of, of their success. You just have to look at their buildings, which still stand after 2,000 years, whereas the Italian buildings of 50 years ago are crumbling. So. <laughs> I would like to ask uh, a very Aus un-Austrian question of all of you, and like you to all comment on this uh, question. Per your particular lens, in other words, per your particular lens of focus, history, uh, philosophy and economics, monetary theory and IP. What do you see happening in the next two years, one, two years? What do you see the trends that are existing right now manifesting in any landmarks that we might recognize? And why would they be important?
let's let's step aside. <laughs> okay, buy Apple and Bitcoin. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Uh, oh, on IP, I see no progress except the continued march of technology uh, in 3D printing, which will allow patents to be evaded like torrenting and the internet has allowed copyright to be evaded. But uh, I see no uh, institutional or legal changes that will make things better. So copyright patents will continue to slow down, uh, patents will continue to slow down progress and uh, be a big factor in and distorting the market and um, making the COVID vaccine more expensive. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, <laughs> so that's all I have to say. Just a question. Well, what trends in the next two years trends. do you think will happen that will uh, you can invest on? Uh, sorry, no. <laughs> I, Mike, I think uh, inflation has come to stay, it's going to be high, it will erode the purchasing power of the dollar, of the euro, of all major currencies in the world. Um, people will get the short end of the stick, the state will, will, will be enriched by, by inflation, Hans uh, raised, raised the question, who, who benefits? Of course, the government in particular uh, benefits because uh, if we have a progressive income tax, for instance, nominal wages will go up to compensate the increase uh, in overall prices, and so there will be this uh, bracket creep. Uh, real taxation will increase, and the benefit uh, goes to, to, to the government. Um, banks, for instance, the financial industry will also benefit greatly. If there's inflation, there's more money around, the nominal volumes they have under management increase and they earn 1% of the nominal value, so they benefit as well. Um, the banking industry may in particular be uh, uh, a, a benefit. A, a, you know, get some additional windfall profits, assume inflation goes up and uh, people can no longer afford how the houses. They go bankrupt. And so the, the banks will get uh, the, the, the owners of, of, of housing and real estate. And um, so I think this is another sector that will benefit from, from inflation. So inflation, that's just a footnote to referring to Hans' question. Inflation, I think, is, is going to stay high, and in some parts of the world you will get hyperinflation. And um, the political reaction, I think you mentioned that already, is um, governments will interfere into the, into the market. They will impose maximum prices for food, for, for energy. They will ration, ration, uh, rationing uh, gas and oil. And, and I think the Western world will transform into something we have seen last uh, uh, in the 1930s in, in Germany, namely a controlled economy. They call it Befehls- und Lenkungswirtschaft, where the government is in charge basically of calling the shots, who produces what at, uh, and under which conditions, and who is allowed to consume what kind of good uh, and what kind of quantities. And so that's, that's the underlying trend I see at the moment. And the, one of the biggest challenges is, of course, to get, um, to get some protection against uh, the debasement of the currencies. I don't have much to add uh, other than uh, even if it doesn't come to outright uh, government control and regulation uh, in, in all markets of the economy, uh, this inflationary trend also will lead to the concentration of market power, generally speaking. So because the inflation benefits big businesses at the expense of smaller competitors, so uh, what the Marxists predicted uh, would happen in a market economy will actually happen. We will have a kind of monopolization of markets. Um, big businesses will benefit, smaller competitors will be ruined, uh, but it is of course not because of the market dynamic, uh, it's because of uh, the inflationary interventions. I, I do agree with the previous speakers. I see uh, going on since a few years uh, a deliberate attack against small businesses and against the medium class. The idea is to destroy these both uh, categories by means of, of uh, regulations, by means of inflation, and during the next winter I see 
uh, energy crisis and shortages and food shortages coming up. And uh, so the world will be a very dangerous place to live in. And uh, I don't see any anyone who is uh, capable to stop this development because most of the of the governments who still call the shots are in the the hands of exactly the same people who want to 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 reach these effects the uh, big hope is the creation of something else of independent communities of of uh, sort of free states uh, on the model of of uh, John Galt's idea of, of somewhere to hide. It's not easy because technology is not that of the of the 50s and 60s when Ayn Rand wrote uh, Atlas Shrugged, but still there is maybe the way to exploit technology to get rid of, of the influence of the states. For example, we have lots of, of doctors who are prevented from working because they didn't get the shot. They can do it anyway, and so there are lots of people who would rather go to a doctor who is uh, who is uh, who didn't get the vaccine and who has some independence of mind, and maybe there's the possibility to build some parallel system. It will be very difficult, but I see this as the only hope. Uh, in fact, I don't have much to add, so we better get to the next question. <laughs> I have a question for Professor Gita Hudsman. So it's a two-part question. Uh, the first part of my question is rather, I suppose I'm playing devil's advocate in asking this. Uh, Professor Rothbard in, I forget the title of the particular essay in which he makes this point, but he remarks that he uh, disagrees with Professor Mises' uh, view that praxeological laws are derived from uh, from facts about the logical structure of mind. Professor Rothbard instead says that he is an Aristotelian or a neotomist. So he views the action axiom as a law of reality rather than a law of, of the mind. And therefore, Professor Rothbard, at least in his uh, work on economic methodology, emphasizes the importance of metaphysics more than uh, Professor Mises did. Um, and I'm curious as to whether you think uh, professor, adopting Professor Mises' Kantian uh, foundation, I suppose you could call it, is necessary for developing uh, a, a praxeological system for, for analyzing uh, economic phenomena. And my, uh, the second part of my question is, even if Professor Mises uh, emphasizes the primacy of practical reason over metaphysical speculation in, uh, in economic science, is he still not engaging in a type of metaphysical speculation when he says, for example, that man is a purposeful being, when he says that man acts purposefully? To me, it seems as if he is implying, it seems that he is implying that what man essentially is, the essence of man, is a purposeful being, and therefore he is engaging or saying something ontological about, about man and, and therefore metaphysical. And uh, in order to... Uh, I suppose, analyze economic phenomena or develop economic laws, uh, it seems to me that, that one would have to affirm the existence of a reality that is common to all men. And the affirmation of such a reality would require metaphysical speculation, in my view. For example, uh, Fichte, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, the German idealist, uh, builds upon uh, Kant's work and says that reality is Tathandlung, uh, is pure liveliness or activity, and it, it is not substance. But yet it, it is still a, a theory of reality, a, a metaphysical position, which Fichte, uh, I suppose, builds uh, from, from, or constructs from, from Kant's uh, work. So I suppose to, to, to summarize, uh, do you think ad adopting Professor Mises's Kantian uh, framework is necessary for developing a sound praxeological system? And uh, is Mises also not engaging in a type of meta metaphysical speculation when he, for example, when he uh, uh, analyzes or, or calls man uh, a purposeful being? Yeah, uh, thanks for the thoughtful uh, questions. Uh, I'll start with the second one first. Um, 
it's, it's a good point that you make, right? Um, but I guess Mises uh, himself w would uh, or could reply that he was focusing only on, on the difference, on the observable differences. Uh, we know that human beings do have purposes. They pursue projects. They consciously choose between objectives and ends and, and so on. And that sets them apart from animals who react only to stimuli and to, from minerals and so on who do not uh, react at all. I think because they were, that's the only, I was only re relying on this, on this difference. So it's not really an ontological proposition which would be, which would get him into trouble by uh, in comparison to his own uh, standards, right? Now, as far as the, the first question is concerned, um, uh, I actually think the vocabulary that Mises uses, uh, which is Kantian, uh, is uh, completely superficial. And, and he himself says, let's not stay, let's not wax, uh, pl place too much uh, importance uh, on this, uh, however we call this, that's really not that important. And he was using a, a language that was standard, certainly in the German language university landscape, which was his in the 1920s, 1930s, and even after World War II, um, which was, was very widespread, right? So, I mean, you use these terms, and even the logical positivists who are not Kantians, uh, they, they use these terms as well, only to say, well, but Kant was wrong, uh, as far as uh, natural research and so on is concerned. Now, um, I, I think there are lots of elements in, in Mises that indicate what he does. I mean, certainly he has elements of, of a Kantian uh, approach, but they are not very strong, right? And you find it in other uh, of his works, for example, in the theory of money. The first part of his money book is the title, The, the Nature of Money, The Essence of Money. Now, that doesn't sound very Kantian, right? So it sounds very Aristotelian. And he also emphasizes in the ultimate foundation of economic science, there are various passages that you can give a Kantian reading, but he also emphasizes that he's talking about the real structure, right? The, the logical structure of the human mind. So it's something that is uh, not something that is um, uh, a, a mental construction, but that is something that is in nature there, right? Now, again, the, the important point is that the logical structure of, of the mind is such that we operate with meaning, that we do make choices, that we do value. Now, uh, is this something that is a, a thought construct? Certainly not. It's something that is there in reality. So I think you can give him a, a, a Kantian, uh, a, excuse me, an Aristotelian uh, reading, right? And Rothbard, when he says, well, it's not a priori in the sense that it comes from mental, but for, uh, in the sense that it's before all experience, but that what we know about the structure of the mind is itself subject of experience, I think Mises would concur, right? And if you read the ultimate foundation of economics, it says, yes, we, we know this. It's something that is part of human uh, knowledge, right? Not empirical in the sense that it comes through, through the senses, but empirical in the sense that we gain knowledge about it through reflecting on, our, on the structure of our mind. Yeah, I think as far as the difference between Mises and Rothbard is concerned, I think it's purely semantic. This is meaningless. But they are of the same opinion in this regard. They use slightly different vocabulary, that's all it is. And as far as the teleological structure of humans is concerned, anybody who denies it would have to say this sort of stuff. And by saying this, whatever, that you are teleological or disputing it, would refute himself, he tries to dispute it because he says something that is aimed at a certain goal, uses means to do it, the statement can be right or wrong, attempt to persuade other people can be successful or unsuccessful. So I think it is indisputable that men is a teleological entity, being, or whatever it is. Last question. Um, this is to Mr. Kinsella. Uh, what do you think of the title transfer theory of contracts compared to the definition you presented? 
I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, what you think of the title transfer theory of contracts, uh, it's, Rothbard has touched on it, um, compared to the, the theory you present. C cyber transfer? C no, title transfer. Oh, sorry. yes, no, um, no, th this is my, I think it's one of Rothbard's greatest contributions. Um, he, uh, he actually, uh, he was very humble because in Ethics of Liberty he wrote a chapter restating and building on Williamson Evers' work. But in research I've done, it looks like Rothbard came up with it first and sort of talked with Evers and Evers developed it and then Rothbard built on it. Now, neither one is a lawyer, so there's some imprecision and there's some mistakes and they're operating without a net. And I wrote a big article trying to build on that. But I think it's one of his greatest contributions, to, actually. I've written, I had a Tom Woods episode about it and I've, I've written about it. So, uh, no, I think it is the way to reformulate and understand contracts. And my talk today was largely uh, based upon that. So, and he was, was interested in uh, contract theory, you know, read my article and read, and read Rothbard's article on Ethics of Liberty. Okay, I w want to thank the panelists and I want to say uh, uh, one, one little remark about what to expect in the future uh, to come back to uh, what, what you asked before. <laughs> so, uh, it will be cold in Europe um, and, <laughs> the, and, and keep in mind Erdogan did not participate in the sanctions because of that oil and gas still flows to Turkey, and you can take hot showers for a few more days here. It might not be so certain once you get home, but I can, you can still use it. So take advantage of the, of the Turkish, Turkish way. They have their problem with inflation, but the hot waters will flow for a while. <laughs>